went up. So this is part of the Visiting Scholars series that's being sponsored by the Dean's Office and by her. So Manuel and Jesse are here. If you have other questions about her, um, please let them know. It's my great privilege and honor to have the opportunity to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Brian Burt. So Brian and I have known each other for a long time now. Um, some of you may not know, before I came here to Penn, I was on the faculty at the University of Maryland. And Brian was in one of the last classes I taught there. Uh, Higher Education American Society, and it's funny for, th for those of you who interact with students, you don't always, you, you don't say this out loud, but you don't always remember every single student. But Brian <laughs> is one of those students that I, one of those people who I had the pleasure of knowing then and uh, continuing to stay in touch with. I was struck at that time by his intellectual curiosity, by the wonderful questions that he asked. You can come in, yes. Um, and by his passion for learning. And so, um, you know, that was when he was in the master's degree program at the University of Maryland. Susan, welcome. Glad to have you. So, Brian, after he completed his master's degree at the University of Maryland, he stayed on there and worked as the coordinator for scholarships and special programs in undergraduate studies office at the business school at the University of Maryland. He's also very helpful. <laughs> uh, he then went on to earn uh, to his, the doctoral degree program in higher education at the University of Michigan. And now he's an assistant professor at Iowa State in the higher education program in the School of Education there. In his work, he uses qualitative methodological approaches. He's very interested in the experiences of graduate students. And he's also really concerned with the institutional policies and practices that influence students educational and workforce outcomes and pathways. He has two strands of research. One is around understanding the science of team science. And he's also interested in exploring the experiences of underrepresented graduate students of color in engineering. His work is really um, interesting. You're publishing in great places. Among other honors, he's received the National Academy of Education Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowship. He also has a National Science Foundation Early Career uh, Award recipient. And uh, he's disseminating his work in all kinds of different venues. We're so excited that they, we have the opportunity to learn from you today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, can you hear me in the back? OK. So just an FYI, we transformed the room a little bit so this can be my classroom. So it'll be less presentation and more teaching. So this way, I'll feel more comfortable. Um, so I will make my way down and make sure I'm talking to those in the back and give you all some coverage. But thank you, thank you, thank you all for being here. This is an amazing uh, experience. One, to be here with my esteemed colleagues, but also to get to know the talented students at, at University of Pennsylvania that I've heard so much about. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, just in the, in the whole, realm of, of doing thank yous, I also know that those people, or there'll be people like me who will watch this recording in the years to come. Uh, and so I thank those who are watching the video in the future. I also thank my parents for providing me with the opportunities and the background to be here and the support. Um, and then finally, I thank my ancestors for the sacrifices that they made for me to be here. Um, and given the context historically of where we're situated, um, I am literally standing on their shoulders and their backs and their remains um, today. So I, I really honor them because people like me couldn't even stand in a building like this um, many years ago. So in 2017, Black faculty members in engineering were 630 out of 27,000 in the field of engineering. That's 2.3%. In the same year, 2017, black males comprised only 732 out of 70,000 enrolled in doctoral programs in engineering. 
across the US. But what I want to talk about or start off is this 1.1%. 1.1% is 128 out of almost 12,000 doctoral degrees earned by black males in 2017. 1.1%. So a lot of people ask me why this work? Why this focus on black males in, in graduate education? So a lot of people uh, look at the problem as a pipeline or a pathway, right? They, they like to start at the K-12 level. How can we generate interest to get people interested in science and mathematics so that they can begin to enter into the pathway? That's a very valuable frame, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I take a different approach. Instead, I look more at a top-down. I look at those who are on the precipice of completing graduate school. Those who are likely to be the next in line to be the faculty members, the role models, the industry leaders, who can motivate a younger generation to get in STEM. So it's not that one approach is better than the other, it's just I have a different approach, okay? So I, again, so I tend to look at those at the graduate, um, at the graduate level. There's one quotation that really resonates with me that I want to share with you also. Um, one thing that I kind of want to say to kind of frame this talk is the way that my work is different is some, some scholars or some research talks about black males or even underrepresented students of color. Uh, what's wrong with them? Why can't they do better so that there can be more than 1.1%? That's not the frame that I take. Instead, I look and think about what are the systems and structures that are preventing more than 1.1% from being successful? And how can we identify or understand from those 1.1%, how can we learn how they're high achieving and then recreate the conditions that allow them to be successful? Hopefully so that then we can create um, more than 1.1%. But Tapia and Johnson say, when one third of this country's population remains on the outskirts of science and technology in the university, what does it say about the university and its understanding of human potential? Understand the emphasis, the onus is on the institution, the university. We can also think of institutions as K through 12 systems, the schooling process. In what ways do systems and structures, how are they responsible for human potential, not the individual? So today, we're gonna to talk about broadening participation in STEM, identifying barriers, and promoting promising policies and practices. I love alliteration and so, I practice that several times because I like the tongue twister, <laughs> the nature of it. Um, there are a lot of people who can't be here. So for those of you who are technologically savvy, this is my Twitter handle. Uh, so feel free, for those in the back that can't see it, it's Brian underscore A underscore Bert. Um, feel free to engage this conversation as well as uh, for those who are not able to be present. There are some things that I need from you because I will not talk at you this entire 50 minutes. One, think about what information from this study have you already read or heard before? Two, what information from this study is new? Thirdly, people generally ask, so what institution is this? Or they try and guess. And the answer is, well, one, I can't tell you, but <laughs> the real answer is assume that it's your institution because it probably is. And then finally, even though we're talking about STEM, what implications does this study's findings have on your own experiences, professional practice, and or research? So before we move on, turn to a neighbor point in a, a friendly way, point to a neighbor because that's going to be your discussion partner. 
throughout our presentation. So clearly there's a need for more gatherings like this because there's a lot of energy in interaction. So that's wonderful. Okay, so what I want to do in this presentation, I'm trying something different. Um, I'm actually going to combine two different research talks. So what I want to do is first provide some overview of kind of the overarching, the big study from which the smaller studies um, originate and also kind of the ideas or the thinkings around the methods that I tend to use. So the full study currently includes 42 black men at four top-ranked Research One Association of American Universities, AA institutions. I only put the AA in there just to denote that these are top institutions. And of, not of course, but because they're at um, AA institutions, AAU institutions, the engineering colleges are also some of the top engineering colleges. So we'll, I'll talk a little bit about limitations a little bit later, but one limitation up front is that this is a particular type of student who goes to a particular type of institution that is admitted to a particular type of top-ranked engineering college, right? So there is some type of information for you to filter as you're thinking about the type of students who we'll be talking about in this study. Originally, I started with a pilot at one, um, one institution. I engaged in one one-on-one -on -one interviews, and what I learned from that was it was just way too much information to cover. Um, but at that time, uh, the pilot group had one-on-one -on -one, uh, semi-structured qualitative interviews, and I did a follow-up focus group uh, just so I could test some early working hypotheses that I had. And then, of course, every participant that I've had has uh, completed a demographic form. The current research design, however, uh, includes two interviews because I learned it was just way too much information. And I'll, I'll revisit this in the uh, end a little bit, but many of the students said that this was the first time they had ever been asked about their experiences. So what was designed for one hour of an interview, many times went two and a half hours. So trying to budget two and a half, or arrange between an hour and two and a half hours was too variable for me. So I split it into two interviews. Uh, and again, the other things pretty much are the same, the follow-up focus groups uh, and demographic form. In the demographic form, that's where I ask information about uh, how students identify in terms of their race and, race and ethnicity, um, whether or not they are born in the U.S. or outside the U.S., their educational backgrounds, and, well, their educational backgrounds, I mean, their undergrad uh, institutions, whether it be a historically black college, a predominantly white institution, so forth. Uh, I know a lot of information about their family background, so their parents' uh, education levels, as well as how they rate themselves in terms of socioeconomic status. I'm trying to think what else is in there. And I also have information about their high school GPA and undergrad GPA. Overall speaking, and I'm not going to put the statistics up, but understand, again, this population. This is a population that, for the most part, they were all had the credentials of being uh, stellar in undergrad, high school, undergrad, and now graduate school. So an assumption that they would, they would be on the verge of, let's say, at risk of dropping out is ironic given their uh, portfolio, right, uh, coming into graduate school. I tend to work from a social, social constructivist paradigm, which suggests that I believe um, at least from my work and the type of ways that I think, that people learn by interacting with each other, right? Learning is a social, a social phenomenon. And so one thing that we'll be talking about when we see the voices from the students is a lot of who they think they are and who they are coming to be 
is in relationship to how they interact with other people. So that's why I use the uh, social constructivist paradigm. My work generally includes both individual and, and team analyses. So generally how it works is I generally, I do all my data collection so far, uh, or have done it so far. I generally take the first stab of analyses, and I'll uh, talk about analysis in a second. But now I have a research group, and I'll, I'll share more about them later. I have a research group, and so they generally take the second and third analyses of, of every study that we do. So it's very iterative, but generally I'm taking the first stab so that I have a big scope of what the stories are, and then I um, task them to go look for other things or to discover things that perhaps I missed. Because it's both me and a team of students working on data, we have regular conversations about our positionalities, who we are, right? Race, gender, ethnicity, sexuality or sexual orientation, um, schooling, upbringing, all of those things impact who we are and how we make sense of the data that we're reading and analyzing. So we engage in those conversations very frequently, as well as our subjectivities. How do our, our possible viewpoints impact uh, the work that we do, right? Potential biases. And then how can we think about ways to mitigate those biases, or at least acknowledge them for readers? I won't go into necessarily the steps, but I generally do adapted techniques of grounded theory, mainly because the study on black men in engineering graduate programs is not, it's, it's growing now, but there are probably a handful of people who are doing this work, and a lot of the work needs to be theorized and made sense of. So a lot of the techniques I use come from grounded theory. I say adapted techniques because for those who do qualitative work, it's still evolving. Right? And there are different approaches to grounded theory, whether it's traditional or some of the um, more contemporary models. Uh, but I've learned a way of doing it uh, myself, and I can go into more details about it. But what's important is probably, for me, the theory building and the propositions for future testing. And the way that we accomplish that generally is because we do both a, a hybrid of both inductive uh, and deductive types of analyses. The deductive generally is related to, like I said, if I've gone through the data and I've taken a pass through the data, I already then have some type of a priori codes or things that I'm thinking about. And then from there, I allow my students to look for those things as well, as well as um, to identify other topics. Okay, that was a lot to give to you, but I wanted to start that up front. Okay, so let's jump right in, study one. This one is about identifying the impediments or the barriers. So prior research suggests that racialized experiences happen both within and outside of the classroom. So what are racialized experiences? Racialized experiences tend to be described as anything that forces a, a person of color to realize that they're different, that they're other, and not in a pleasant way, but generally in a pejorative way, right? So for some students, it might be walking into a classroom and realizing you're the only one. For some students, that could be a racialized experience. Um, it could be going into your research lab and being the only person of color. For some people, that's a racialized experience. For some, it might be not even in the classroom, but when you leave campus and you go to try and find a barber shop or a salon or a, or a grocery store that sells ethnic foods and you can't find it, that might make you feel othered, right? So what's important about this literature is that it happens both within and outside the classroom. What that suggests is that these experiences happen frequently at all levels. At the community, at the university level, within your college, within your department or program, within your research lab, sometimes within your advising experience and also sometimes within your peers. 
but it happens at all levels. It's nested within all levels. Secondly, racialized experiences happen within critical relationships. So what are the critical relationships? You would think that a critical relationship, one, is that between the student and the advisor. The advisor is supposed to be your coach, your mentor, your person of support. <laughs> but the majority of students of color suggest that it's the advisor who offers the most barriers to them to be successful. So who might be another critical relationship? Any ideas? No answers. Other students. Students. Your peers. Peers are another form of critical relationships. That's actually understudied because existing literature all generally suggests that it's only uh, the relationship between the advisor and the student. But we're actually starting to learn that the relationship at the graduate level with one's peers are equally important. Ah, the question is about what about family? Let's wait for study two. <laughs> um, so peers. Peers are, a, are an important um, connection, relationship in graduate school. But what happens when you don't have the peer group? Or what happens when your peer group also uh, are not sources of support, but are rather sources of despair? Then who does a student have? That was more rhetorical. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good that you're actively thinking, because some of that will come up in study two. And you'll see then how study one and study two are connected. So keep, keep the brain uh, waves going. OK. Conceptual model. To begin to try and think about how to make sense of, of what's going on for graduate students, we drew from the Bowman, Roll, Strand, and Adaptation model. What's interesting about this, uh, about this model is, one, it is more of a strength or asset-based approach that suggests that you have to look at psychosocial resources that students tap into to overcome their barriers. Some psychosocial uh, resources could be community, could be family, could be peers or, or aspects of like that or aspects like that as well as individual level. Another benefit though is that the model suggests that you can't just look at how somebody overcomes, but you also have to understand what were the barriers or the challenges that they were trying to overcome to begin with. So this model provides a very holistic understanding of both the challenges and how somebody overcomes them. So given that, the questions that this study addresses are, what are the critical contexts and relationships that influence black male students' experiences in engineering? What influences do these contexts and relationships have on students' persistence in engineering? And if they're time, and I'll gauge to see how we're going, I'll throw in a bonus. How does the engineering graduate experience promote or maintain black male students' engineering identity? And why does an engineering identity even matter? The reason it's in parentheses is because that's actually going to be one of the papers that I'm working on uh, in the future. I'm, that's going to be a major piece that is, is still in my head um, and is still in the data, but is uh, it's becoming revealed more and more. Um, but I can begin letting you know what I'm beginning to see and what I'm thinking. OK, very briefly, as it relates to this study, this is a uh, one-on-one semi-structured qualitative interviews, a follow-up focus group. This was based on only one of the four institutions. So this, one only, this study only includes one institution. This study only included 21 participants. And again, uh, adapted grounded theory techniques. As it relates to this particular study, the limitations, remember, this is one institution one highly ranked institution. So how the findings relate to other types of institutions, for example, historically black colleges and universities, um, institutions that aren't necessarily top ranked or research one, the findings could be different, or the experiences of the students could be different. Uh, 
And then also, there's a lot to be said about these types of students at this particular type of institution. There might be different barriers taking place at other institutions. And then there might be other ways that students navigate those barriers at other types of institutions. Those should be considered. OK. I'm ready to jump into the findings. So we're going to talk about two main things in this study. One, the ecological impediments of underrepresentation. And two, peer prejudice as a sociological impediment. So we're going to start with a quotation from Marcus. Marcus is a third year mechanical engineering. Is Marcus in the room? <laughs> Slide 11. Okay. You can. I would ideally love for there to be more African American men in my class. People are naturally going to want to be around people who look like them. As a black man in engineering, I don't have that camaraderie. So I am forced to immediately look outside of my comfort zone in order to find people who I can study with, talk with, and have overall support. There is not that support there for me to succeed. So Marcus's words are powerful for a number of reasons. And I want to unpack only a little bit of that. Let me provide some context. At this institution for this study, Marcus and some of his peers were admitted at the time in which institutions could still target and recruit black students or underrepresented students. And then after their first year, there began to be attacks on affirmative action. And institutions became scared that they were going to be sued. So they all started, they all stopped uh, recruiting, actively recruiting students of color. So Marcus saw the transformation between his engineering college having a larger, more thriving black population to a dwindling population. And as a result, he says, there's not that type of support for me to be successful. There's a, a direct connection between the underrepresentation of people who look like him and how he thinks or what he thinks he needs to be successful. We now have empirical data that suggests the implications of affirmative action being attacked. When students are saying that they now need to see people who look like them, and these are the ways that it shows up for them. Similarly, Alfonso, a fifth year electrical engineer. Where's Alfonso? If you can speak up loudly for those in the back as well. You have to be comfortable with, I guess, being in the minority role. You know what I mean? In terms of the people here. Like if you're used to like growing up and let's say everyone you talk to, everyone in your school is black. The environment is kind of set up to that culture and promoting and building up that culture. And then you come to some place like Midwestern University. There's like white and Asian grad students and professors. There's definitely a lack of black, black professors and black colleagues. So if you're not used to that environment, not comfortable working in that environment, interacting with people in that environment, it's going to be tough for you to be at Midwestern University and to be successful. So Alfonso says some things that are kind of haunting to me. Basic, basically, he's suggesting the type of student who would thrive at this institution. <clears throat> One who is used to predominantly white environments. One who knows how to navigate it or navigate them. Inversely, though, he's saying, if you're used to being somewhere that validates your culture, you're not going to get that here. And therefore, this is going to be a place where you struggle. So what does that say about our institutions if students are saying that these institutions aren't places that validate and affirm students' cultures? And what implications, implications does that also have for faculty and staff and those who work with students? So I want to transition a little bit to peer prejudice. I'm, yeah, peer prejudice as a sociological impediment. Chris, a fifth year 
chemical engineer. Um, I'm reading from Chris's statement, and he says, Asians, you know, they have a study group. They have a purpose coming here. They get together. They pass, uh, they have support networks, such as these tests that they pass down. Whereas a black man, there's very, very few African Americans in these different departments. For example, my department, I might be the only one. I'm the only one in my department. So the experiences to me are very, very much different. I'm looked at differently. I think I'm scrutinized even a little bit uh, more. Thank you, Chris. So you're gonna see a theme about students identifying their white and their, when they say Asian, they're referring to their international Asian peers. Um, you're gonna see them, those populations come up in our students' conversations a little bit more. But what's interesting, I think, from this quotation <coughs> is, again, another example of how the peer group serves as sources of support in very critical ways, academic support. And I won't get too in detail yet because I think that there's a captivating one in, the, in a couple uh, quotations. But I want to preview this notion that students are describing how they have to navigate by themselves. And the notion that they're aware that they are possibly the only ones that have to do that because other people have the social support that they need to be academ academically successful. So we're going to continue talking about peer prejudice and I'm going to then pull uh, some other comments together as it relates to peers. We hear back from Alfonso. <clears throat> With the grad students at Western University, there's a lot of Asian students and they work together. It's not, you can't always get into that group. Okay, so let's talk about these study groups because we have heard about this now a couple times. Well, now looking at my data, I didn't see it as a pattern when I heard it maybe two or three times, but when I got to 17 and 23 <laughs> and 37 and 38 times that I'm hearing it from students across institutions, I realized that there's actually a pattern going on. So let's think about this study group concept. Can you imagine what it's like to know that you should be in a study group? That the study group might possibly be the key to passing your classes and to be socialized in a graduate college experience. So to know that you should have it or be a part of it, but to be denied access to the study group. So to be clear, what Alfonso is saying is it's not that, what he was trying to say is, it's not that I don't want to get in the study group. It's that you can't always get into the study group. Because what Alfonso doesn't say here, but others do, is that they all wanted to be in study groups, but they were denied access into the study groups. Because their white and their international um, colleagues made them feel that they had to prove that they were smart enough to be in the study group that they weren't just admitted because of affirmative action or how they look. So again, I pose to you, imagine psychologically what it might be like to know that you should be in a study group, but your peers won't let you in it. So then what happens? Trey, a fourth year chemical engineer says, I'm sitting here trying to be Superman and do it, study by myself. So that's, that's what happens. Psychologically, when other people try and make you prove that you're good enough to join their study group, you do that. You try and prove it by being by yourself. So I'm going to throw in the, like I told you, some working hypothesis in a couple quotations. Paul, fourth year electrical engineer, talks, begins to talk about persistence and pull it together for us. Paul? It is not just my advisor, but also the department, the school, and the social scene. I think all of these things, if you don't feel like you have a positive or supportive environment in any of those, they could all be reasons that you wouldn't want to stick around here for a long time. 
Hey, Chris. Well, instead of going through this prejudice in my school and in my department, I can go and get a job with my master's degree and make good money and maybe work my way up. Mm -hmm. The plan changes, but you, you get away from the negativity that is in their department. Okay, so what did we learn? That for some students, the barriers to just going to classes and doing well and being successful and doing something that they love, engineering, sometimes is so much so tumultuous that it might just be easier to drop out than to deal with negative experiences with your advisor, negative experiences with your peers. That in part is a, is a portion related to engineering identity. I see some down faces, and it's okay. We will get to a rosier side, but I'm gonna take a quick pause here. This part, study one, this is not intended to be a rosy story. This is not happy. And there have been generations of people who have not had a happy experience. So this study, as I call it, my anchor piece, that I'm hoping for the rest of my career, this will always be the one I'll be able to point to. This study needed to be the first one that went out. Because everybody likes to hear the happy story, but before they can hear the happy story, they need to know what the negative aspects are. Or I recently uh, gave a presentation to engineering deans, and I told them, this is your dirty and ugly mirror reflecting back at you. And that's what this study is. So I see some down faces, and that's OK. But it's important that we understand what's going on for students. Okay, so what I want to do before I get into kind of some overarching discussions, I, I had an assumption that there were going to be quite a bit of students in the audience. So I wanted to take this, use this platform to just share with you how I think about uh, creating implications, implications for policy, research and theory, and practice. This is a strategy that I have learned how to do in the last few years, and now I teach my students, uh, particularly those in my research group and when I teach qualitative methods. What I do is I create a table that lays out my themes and my findings. In today's presentation, I only talked about underrepresentation and peer prejudice. Okay? And then I make columns for uh, each of the implications that I want to address. Then what is important to do is that I take whatever the finding is and I I address a, a implication for policy, a implication across all the columns. I take it all the way through um, and remind myself that, okay, this implication needs to be directly connected to this finding. This implication needs to be directly connected to this finding. And I do it for every single one of my findings. By doing it like this, I streamline the findings and the discussion. As a, as a reviewer now, what I've learned is sometimes people will have findings and then their discussion and their implications are all over the place. And there's no direct connection. So at least for me, visually, this is the way that makes sense of how to connect my findings with my discussion. And for the students that I'm going to meet afterwards, if you want to talk more about how I do this process, we can engage in that conversation later. Okay. So what are some big picture topics? First. Role strain caused by underrepresentation poses barriers for students' persistence. Okay, what this means is underrepresentation matters. Admitting more black students matters. Admitting more, or I'm sorry, hiring more black faculty matters. Because underrepresentation is related to engineering identity and is related to persistence. Now, that's not easy. What it takes, though, what I'm not suggesting is that students need to work harder to get better GRE scores. What I am saying is that faculty and those in positions of power need to begin to rethink what creativity looks like. If creativity is the barrier, or if we're only using one metric of how we think about admissions, faculty and administrators need to rethink that so that we can begin to address the underrepresentation issues. But also, just admitting and hiring more black faculty or underrepresented faculty is not the only solve. 
We also need to make sure that we have uh, the culture and experiences and the climate that will support them in being successful. Secondly, racialized experiences affect black males' persistence. I also said it is cumulative, meaning it doesn't generally just happen once. It happens regularly and frequently. And it's those cumulative effects that impact students. So what we talk about in the paper, in the study, is that what is needed, likely, is community-wide uh, cultural training. So we saw a lot of information about increasing amounts or engagements between the international Asian students. And I want to be clear, I, I don't have anything against international Asian students or white students or anything. But what it does suggest is that any change in a community population, there needs to be some cultural understanding required for faculty, students, staff members. The community needs to engage and understand how the community should communicate with each other across race, across ethnicities, across cultures. That needs to be a priority for everyone in the educational community. And then finally, engineering identities are threatened in the College of Engineering environment. So I want to take a pause right here for you to think a little bit about what you just heard and discuss with your partner. What information from the study you read, have you read or heard before? What information from the study is new? And what implications does this study's finding have on your own experiences, professional practice, and or research? Okay, so I'm a teacher, and teachers, we have to ad lib, and I realize that my time is dwindling, and I want to make sure that we have ample time for question and answer. So, what I'm going to do is preview for you what study two is, okay? And then we'll have ample time for question and answer. So study two was or is about promoting persistence. Uh, just very briefly, literature in the past, outdated literature, always suggested that the key to being successful in graduate school is related to the relationship with one's advisor. That's it. Okay, That's the premise. Uh, and so my study aimed to better understand or better explain uh, the other villages, the, the village of support that students had that helped them to be uh, successful and persist. In particular, the question was what edict and emic adaptive strengths do black males in graduate engineering programs employ at predominantly white institutions to promote persistence? This one was based on two time one on one interviews, a follow up focus group, three institutions, and 30 participants. Um, so, as alluded to earlier on, the findings from this study talk about social support from family social support from undergrad faculty mentors. And, and let me just say something about the faculty mentors. Uh, what's interesting about this finding in particular is people assume that once you graduate from undergrad, you pack them up, you wish them well, and then you send them <laughs> off, right? But what I actually learned from this study is that these are the mentors who told the students they were good enough to go into graduate school. Amen. And when they got to graduate school, they never got those affirmations from their current advisor. So what students did was they stayed in touch with their undergrad faculty members 
throughout graduate school. So connections to one's undergrad faculty mentor serves as a source of support for graduate students. Something brand new that I'd never read. Um, so that's one thing that I'm extremely excited about um, sharing. Of course, the, the family connection, we've known from existing research that family is important. What is also important about this finding, though, is it's not just the parents, but it's the uncles, the aunts, the siblings, right? And it's also the ways in which family encourages students. So in this particular study, we talk about parents uh, making students feel supported in a field that sometimes if you're black, um, this, the field of STEM, is, it's not the fun thing being called white or being nerdy. But the role of family members in supporting students, despite some of those social supports, to do something else, entertainment, um, athletics, right? So that social support from family was mon uh, uh, monumental. Finally, and this is another big one, the encouragement or spirituality and faith-based communities. So there was one quote that I don't remember who had it, but one quotation basically said, look God, I need your help, right? Um, and I'm sorry for those who were not able to participate in the second study. But what's interesting about this theme that I guess I didn't realize until it was published and now people are engaging me and, and emailing me, is that they said that they always felt like they had to diminish their spirituality and or faith-based communities. Because in STEM, you're supposed to be viewed as objective and hands-off. But these students said, when we didn't have support of faculty members, when we didn't have support of um, peers, it was my church community or spiritual community, so everybody didn't go to church. But it was something about that connection that was um, a, a key way that they were able to persist. So I just want to provide you the images of where these are. So you can actually find these two studies. Um, they are recent uh, American Educational Research Journals. The first one, study one, is Into the Storm, Ecological and Sociological Impediments to Black Males Persistence in Engineering Graduate Programs. And the second is also in American Educational Research Journal. It's called It Takes a Village, the role of IMIC and EDIC adaptive strengths in the persistence of black men in engineering graduate programs. Um, I will say future directions in case somebody has questions about it, but I see my work expanding. Um, and also I see the connections to future funding opportunities. The last thing I, I do want to take the time to, to talk about is that this work, I could not have done this work by myself. It is not just me doing this work. Um, it's, a, it's basically from my, collaborate, my collaborators as well as the students in my research group. And the idea of our research group started at my time in Maryland. And one of our professor colleagues, Sharon Freeze Britt, that's how I learned how to be a faculty member. And it started to plant the seeds of me being a faculty member. This is me in my first year master's program um, at Maryland. But that gave me the ideas of what it could look like to have a research group. And now I'm happy because now I'm a part of building a community one scholar at a time. So I want to publicly thank them um, for those past and present and future students who will join me in this work. So thank you all for your attention and I open it up for questions. <laughs> yeah, and if you can tell me your name and perhaps what program or anything. Hi, I'm Ashley Wallace. Hi, Ashley. Um, I'm not in a program okay. here. I work here in the School of Engineering. Um, okay. My doctoral work is in chemistry. Um, and I transitioned into more of a higher ed role now. Um, so a lot of this is personal for me and a lot of my colleagues being that I am from a STEM background. Um, I'm interested to know if there's a difference between, or if any of these students were in a master's program versus a PhD program, 
or were they all in one? Um, because from experience, I know a lot of my colleagues, if they're in a master's program, their idea is two years in, I'm gone, don't have to worry about it, but the stress for black males and PhDs seems to, that's where the stress comes and is prevalent, so just wondering. That's a great question, thank you, Ashley. So it's interesting because initially, when I started the study eight years ago, I was only focused on PhD students, and recently I've decided I wanted to add master students. Their experiences are different, and I, I don't have a large sample, within my large sample, I don't have a large population of those from master's programs. What's also interesting, or is challenging to address your question, is that some master students are in and out, two years and out, but some start off as masters and then somehow are encouraged. Some, I believe some are filtered out and some are encouraged to transition into the PhD. So it's not really clear to me who is who and or why, like why some are filtered out and why some are pushed through the PhD. From what I do think that I'm seeing, and again, this is me hypothesizing, what I do think that I'm seeing is those who are being filtered out, they do have a different experience, but it almost seems like they are being pushed through. And so in talking to them, I've asked questions, so how would you imagine the ideal advising experience? And they say, I don't know. I mean, I have what I have, and that's OK. It's, it's almost as if their expectations are lower, um, which to me suggests that, and I don't have the data yet to prove it, it suggests to me that they have been set up to think that um, what they have is okay, is good enough. So I don't, and, and they also talk about their experiences differently. Those who I think are being filtered out, they, they, they reframe their experiences as, well, I'm just, a ma I'm just a master student and I'm only here for X amount of years. So it's almost like that's their way of uh, partitioning their experiences just so that they can get out. Does that make sense? Yeah, because yeah. sometimes the expectation from the advisor is lower too. Like you're just here for these two years, why invest time into right. you if yeah. you're not gonna be here for the long haul? Right. So that's what I'm, I feel like I'm seeing and thank you for providing that, that information, the validation, thank you. Um, let me go in the back, one, two, and three. Yes. In our group, oh, so my name is Irtiza. I'm in the Education, Culture, and Society program here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so in our group, we were talking about your um, the point about having the study groups, the engineering study groups, and we were discussing um, the international uh, sort of the dynamic between international students and African American students. And one of the points that came up was perhaps language. I mean, of course, there might be probably some prejudice or bias against black students, especially if you're more recently migrated and all you've seen about black kids are on TV. Mm. But the second point is like language, because sometimes uh, we were saying that perhaps people felt more comfortable speaking in, in the, their language, and if you have to switch to English, then it, it's hard to have that rapport. But then we had this discussion about um, the, the benefits of that outweigh, the benefits of like the social cohesion outweigh kind of the linguistic um, uh, difference that might happen. But anyway, so all that to get to the point of, would it be helpful to have professors assign the groups in order mm. for it to be mixed, or should it be something that organically happens between students? Very great question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, and But let me first say the exact same thing that you just mentioned about uh, issues around language and you know explaining why students need to gather uh, separately and together. That's the exact conversation that communities need to have so that people know why the black students are sitting by themselves, the uh, international Asian students are gathering by themselves. That conversation needs to happen as communities, right? It doesn't happen. Um, so that's one that I wanted to acknowledge. So thank you for sharing that. Two, yes, to your point, pedagogically, I do think that faculty should be doing more work in uh, assigning groups because what happens is Faculty like to think that um, I'll let students, we, we use this word, mm -hmm. form organically. Mm -hmm. Organically, yes. Mm -hmm. And what organic ends up happening is segregation, right? Uh, and I know it's hard. So faculty, I, I understand it's hard. But it takes a little bit more work. Uh, sometimes I put students together based on abilities that I think. Um, 
sometimes I have students count off the fours or fives. And even when I see those groups, if it doesn't look right, I swap people out. Um, it's a little bit more intentionality, but I think that it, it helps the teaching and learning environment more. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yes. So I'm Susan Yoon, I, I teach here at GC, um, I, uh, and I do, um, st I do uh, I study STEM education uh, on the other end, yes. right, so K-12. Um, I thought I heard Laura say that you also have some interest in that, did I hear that? And okay, well, like just a pipeline. I do. So I actually have a paper on the origins of early STEM interests, um, okay. where basically the same population, I ask them questions. When did you yeah. be, get involved in STEM or become right. interested in how was that maintained? So I have some work. Super. Yes. So, and I'm excited because I just downloaded your ARJ paper. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Study number one. And I've noticed the second one's in press, so I'd love to get that from you. Absolutely. Right? Um, yep. So I guess that is the question I have for you. Right, so I've, I work with teachers in, in professional development. I, I also do direct to students as well in urban public schools. What are some um, suggestions that you have, right? Because your population is very specifically, they have gone through the layers That's of right. resistance and ecological barriers. And, and they were, if you want to say, you know, they were relatively successful in getting to that fifth year, right, right? and just about to graduate. So what are some of the things that we ought to be knowing or doing? Um, I, I mean, I have some answers, but mm -hmm. you know, um, what would you tell us to do? Um, at, the, at the which level, K through 12? I'd say high school, high school. Yes, and so what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna send you the origins paper. Okay, perfect. Um, where I actually talk a lot about that. Uh, let me think, let me channel that paper. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're starting to blend. Uh, in the origins paper, there's a, okay, so for those of you who are familiar with YOSO, um, community cultural wealth, um, some might also think about like funds of knowledge. One thing that we talk about in the origins paper is, first of all, stop thinking of stu I'm talking Raleigh, not you. Um, we need to stop thinking of students as being deficient, but rather start thinking about what are the cultural assets that they already possess, and how can we embellish those assets, or tap into those assets. Right? It's, it's the similar conversation uh, across different fields of study where we're talking about culturally responsive pedagogies. Right? So, for example, some students talked about, uh, in one context, a student was, I guess, uh, very excited in class, and the teacher, who I believe was a white woman, read that as disruptive. So the parent intervened and took that student and placed them in a different classroom. And in the next classroom, the, the teacher saw the student as excited and interested um, and needing more, right? And so I guess between the teacher and the parent, they began to uh, engage the student in more STEM-related activities. Because I guess the student was, was curious and bored. Uh, and so, in that example, the students then began going to like museums. Uh, so those are some examples. Another one that I talk about in, the, in that paper with my graduate student is this idea of play. And this actually goes along with, I believe, some of the work of Dr. Ed Brockenbrough, Brockenbrough and some others in that black boys are not being able to be boys. They're expected to be men at young ages. Um, and so one thing that we encourage is that, like, let these boys play, right? But the play can also be connected to learning. So for example, in a, the students from this sample who are now older talked about playing with Legos. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just letting them play with Legos just to entertain themselves. The parents would talk to them, so what did you just build? Why did you build it like that? What if you built it this way instead? Right, so there's an aspect of cognition that's also going in connection to STEM. Similarly, what, how I related it today is, a lot of people are doing video games on iPads and their phones and um, on some type of console. So don't just let them play video games, but also talk, so what do you think is the math behind what you just did? What might be some science? Or, or engage them in conversations that get them to start thinking about um, the, the academic linkages with their play. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. And there was one person up. Yes. 
Hi, I'm Yolanda Ahsoka. I'm with Penn Engineering. Um, I had a question about whether or not any of your research touched upon the importance of administrators mm -hmm. and how they either help or hinder students um, in their academic progress. And if anything was cited with respect to the role of the importance of having an office of diversity and inclusion to support you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. So, yeah. so here's what I heard. Here's what I heard. The role of administrators in either hindrance and or helping. Um, and did anybody talk about offices of diversity or other support services, right? So I wanted to write a theme about the role of administrators and staff, and I didn't have enough data, so I had to cut it. Um, there was a little bit, what's interesting is where it was gonna show up was gonna be in the It Takes a Village paper, and I was gonna say it's not just faculty, it actually is staff members. I think it may be in the recommendations um, that future research needs to further explore that. I didn't ask people, if, um, specifically about administrators. The question was, who have been your sources of support? And I allowed them to take that conversation wherever they wanted to. Um, some people did mention staff members, but honestly, and this goes to your point about the offices of diversity, most institutions don't have that. Um, and for those that do have it, it's an office of one. So, I'm not sure that they describe it as an office as much as it is one person, right? So I don't have a lot of data yet on it, but uh, so for the next, because of my NSF career, I'm uh, studying four institutions, one per year I focus on. And so some of the institutions that I have um, in queue are institutions that are known to have strong support services. Uh, and I'm doing that because I wanna see what it looks like to for an institution that has a storied history of supporting students of color, and what are the interventions that they have for students? Thank you. One, two. I need somebody else to stop me because I don't know when to stop. Okay. One, two. Hi. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a master's student in the Education Culture and Science program, but mm -hmm. I actually studied mechanical engineering in my undergraduate. Yes. Um, and so I was just wondering if any of the students mentioned the role or influence of ethnicity-based student groups, like the National Society of Office Engineers or the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. So you know for my peers, that was a really big support for them when they couldn't find those study groups. And so I'm just wondering what kind of roles those played. Okay, so that's two questions. That's so you first you said, is there a relationship? And then you said what's the relationship? Okay. So the answer to the first question of do affinity based groups uh, do they play a role in student persistence? The answer is yes. Uh, in what ways do they play? Okay, the quick answer, what I was thinking in my head, and I'm just gonna say it, is that this paper will, that paper is coming. <laughs> um, but I'll share it, because I guess by the time this recording is up, it'll already be published, maybe, so. Um, the role of the, the biggest role is that students can gather in those affinity-based groups, and they don't have to be on. They can go, oh, I see some, I hear affirmations. Um, <laughs> they can go there and they don't feel like they have to be on. It's actually very similar to the ways that students describe for those that go to church. That they can go to church and they don't have to be with an engineer, right? They don't have to talk engineer. They don't have to talk STEM. They can just be themselves. They can be human. Um, that's the biggest role. Um, they feel like they felt support in those spaces. And also, uh, one, one institution in particular has a model that now that that, and it's student-led. It's student-led, but it's institutionally supported, meaning that the College of Engineers supports it financially, but they let the students do it, which is an amazing uh, model. But what's interesting about that organization is that they bring young alums back to the organization. Mm -hmm. So the benefit of that is that students are able to see themselves and see the possibility of persisting. And so I have some data where basically students are saying, I know that I can, things are tough, but I know I can do it because he did it. And I remember what he had to go through. So that's the power of the affinity groups. But what I'm also learning is that most institutions don't have the affinity groups. We have time for one more question. Oh, yes. 
Yes. Now I'm supporting the Admission Pool of Local Years to do that program. Um, the thought about advisors really stuck out to me because I serve as the advisor for elementary and middle years. Um, so the cohort is 16 women, uh, one black woman, mm -hmm. um, the other four Asian, uh, who are five students of color altogether. Um, I'm noticing on the, I guess, the opposite end um, to your study as the, a black advisor that the students of color in the program are using me sort of as a counselor, mm -hmm. um, which adds a mental stress for me. Um, and so, so that's that point. But then the students, the white students, seem to not trust me with my actual role. Mm -hmm. So they'll go to like white colleagues and ask them questions that should be directed to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was just maybe like one or two students, but I'm noticing a pattern. Um, so in one capacity, I'm um, just very like, there's a, like a dependency on me for this sort of like nurture and maternal, you went through this before, mm -hmm. how do I cope with this? Um, and on the other hand, is like, I'm having to prove myself, you know, in this position as a black woman, it seems like, because there's definitely a, a knowledge, a, a database I have of information as a former teacher and math coach and just being in the position is the reason why I'm tired. I hope beyond my skin. Um, so like, I know what I'm talking about, but I'm not, I don't think revered that way by the students that should be referring to me. Um, so I'm not sure of, of the work you've done with that or just thoughts on that, but just for me trying to navigate that space and that also that emotional stress with those feelings of like inferiority start to come back and for me, mm. even knowing that when I wake up I'm supposed to be here and I what I'm talking about, but then not being treated as much. Um, yeah. I don't have an answer. But what I will say is what I have been learning um, now with, again, with my current studies, since I have more flexibility in what I can study and what I want to study, I have decided that in addition to students, I'm also now interviewing black faculty and staff members who support um, black students so that I can, I can begin to understand their experiences. So now they are becoming, staff members like yourself are becoming a part of my study. I just don't have the data yet. But thank you for sharing that and letting me know what's going on. Thank you all very much for coming.